Hello and welcome to this day in esoteric political history from Radiotopia. My name is Jody Avergan. This day, May 28th, 1892, in Memphis, Tennessee, a white mob breaks into and destroys the office of black journalist and activist Ida B. Wells. Wells was out of town at the time, some reports say Philadelphia, some say New York, but she had just written an editorial about a lynching just earlier that spring of three black men that had taken place in Memphis. So, in response to her editorial denouncing extrajudicial violence by a white mob, a white mob broke into her newspaper's headquarters and destroyed it. Wells would leave Memphis shortly thereafter, and like a lot of Southerners, find her way to New York. Eventually, she ended up in Chicago, where she built both a family and continued her crusading, legendary journalistic career. So let's talk about the incident that led to Wells fleeing the South. Here, as always, Nicole Hemmer of Vanderbilt and Kelly Carter Jackson of Wellesley. Hello there. Hello, Jody. Hey there. I don't know if we've done a proper... Ida B. Wells episode in uh, many years of doing this show. So it's about time. And, you know, we'll talk a bit about her career. But this incident itself is, I think, really interesting, too. Um, and I suppose let's just go like beat by beat. I mean, it starts with these, as I mentioned, three black men who are lynched in Memphis in March of 1892. And they are lynched as fallout from an incident at the People's Grocery. So what do we need to know about the People's Grocery incident um, in Memphis? The People's Grocery was a store that was opened by these three men, Thomas Moss, Calvin McDowell, and uh, Henry Stewart. Um, and it had been it had opened as competition to a white-owned grocery store across the street. Um, and that kind of economic competition was seen by the white community as an enormous threat um, because it both meant that they were competing economically, taking money that white people thought was theirs, but also that it could lead to political and social power as well. And so the um, white locals accused these three men of using the store as a meeting place for black men who were who were planning to attack white people. Um, Kelly can tell us the history of this, but like uh-huh. this is this is the rumor that goes back um, at least a hundred years, uh, probably yeah. two hundred. Of oh no, they're getting ready to rise up and kill us, and uh-huh. they use that as a um, justification for then attacking the store and attacking the men who ran the store and ultimately lynching them. Yeah, and I mean, this is something that it's just a common thread throughout the late 19th century and early 20th century. Economic competition with white people put a target on your back, essentially. And so oftentimes the idea is that lynchings were targeted because of sexual assault or because of, you know, these really heinous acts. But oftentimes it was just simple competition, simple economic competition that threatened the sort of supremacy of whiteness in the town that could set off a firestorm. Um, And so if there was an extra grocery store, if there was a bank, if there was, you know, any sort of um, business that uh, was not being monopolized by white people, um, then it could it could cause a, a riot or a massacre or a lynching. Yeah. And, you know, to put this in the larger context, we're talking about 1892 in the South. I mean, I think, you know, this is we're starting to see the real rollback of the modest gains that were made during Reconstruction mm-hmm. in the decades after the Civil War. And I think threats to economic and political power are clearly at the heart of a lot of that pushback. And as Kelly has you know, as we've discussed and Kelly has written about so much, you know, the violence and the pushback happens both at the state level and on the ground in incidents like this. Mm-hmm. So what goes down that leads eventually to um, to this lynching? I mean, well, once these three men are lynched and it's a public lynching, there is pushback, I should say. You know, the, the men, these three men, Moss, McDowell, Stewart, they don't go down without a fight. They shoot back. Actually, several white men are, are shot in the process of this, um, you know, mob attack. Um, but ultimately, these three men lose their lives. And one of the things that is so um, sort of haunting about this particular lynching is what Moss says right before he's murdered. And that is, tell my people to go west. There is no justice for them here. And that sort of warning really sends black residents in the town 
out of the city in a mass exodus. Um, and that's not uncommon either. Whenever there were lynchings that took place, you could expect people to sort of exile themselves to leave the town in droves. But in this instance, about 6,000 African Americans choose to leave the city mm. of Memphis. And it sends a real, you know, shockwave through the entire city that this is the consequence of racial violence. And I realize this is more of a teaser for next week, but Kelly in her new book, We Refuse, talks about this kind of flight or exodus as a kind of resistance to white supremacist violence. Mm -hmm. And so you're seeing that play out on the ground here in Memphis as people, first of all, in just Moss's words themselves, um, but then as people follow his advice and get the hell out of Dodge. And it's a way of saying you can't have our labor, you can't have our lives, you can't have our money. You can't have our investment. Um, when black people leave, it's, it's really no small thing. It's particularly to the white community as well. Yeah. So let's walk Ida B. Wells into this story because this is part of where she comes into this story. So she's a 29-year-old school teacher and a journalist. She's living in Memphis. She knows these folks. She's a friend of the, the three men who um, eventually are lynched. Um, she writes an editorial, as I said in the intro, about this incident, but maybe, you know, She'd been doing muckraking journalism before that, specifically about lynching. So what is sort of her voice at this point that this incident goes down? Kelly, do you want to start the fangirling about Ida B. Wells? Yeah. (laughs) I adore Ida B. Wells. (laughs) Ida B. Wells, to me, outside of like, I think Harriet Tubman is probably one of the most like courageous Mm -hmm. women writing about a moment that really puts her life on the line. I mean, these were not words and ideas that women were generally speaking supposed to write about, speak about, talk about. Um, And Wells is putting it all out there and she's investigating these lynchings and she's getting at the heart of them, talking about them in in the Red Record and in her newspaper. Um, And it makes her a target of the mob as well. You know, anytime um, you draw attention to these violent acts, you made yourself susceptible to violence. And she is unwilling to be quiet. These were her friends. These three grocery store uh, owners were her friends. And she wanted to really talk about the injustice that happened. Um, and as a result of writing about that, um, the mob tax her, her printing press and her newspaper. And this idea of her putting herself out there, I mean, this isn't something that just starts with this lynching. This lynching isn't like a radicalizing moment for her. She was someone who throughout her 20s as a young black woman in the South at a pretty dangerous time was standing up against all sorts of injustice. She had been kicked out of a first class ladies car because Mm -hmm. she had been um, refusing to sit in the segregated carriage. She ends up suing and winning. Yeah. The Supreme Court throws that out. But she yes. she confronts injustice in that way. She also like she joins uh, the the free speech, which is the newspaper uh, that she she writes for, but that she also co-owns because she was like, I'm not joining unless I'm allowed to own part of the business, which mm-hmm. is uh, is a different kind of courage and kind of standing up for yourself. But I think it suggests something about her um, her personality yeah. and yeah. her kind of um willingness to stand up for herself that then plays out in these investigations of lynching. And these investigations were, they were so important because like Kelly was saying earlier, the way that lynching was reported in white newspapers was this black man sexually assaulted this white woman, this Mm -hmm. um, black man wolf whistled at this woman, this black man was planning to attack these white people. And she went and she like looked at the record and she found, no, they like, were drunk in public, or they had a consensual relationship, or they were economic competition. Yeah. Like, but there's no legitimate yeah. claim. I think that's what she's really trying to undermine because it's the ideas. Well, they had it coming. Well, this is well, they this was rape. Well, this was heinous. And she's like, actually, no, this was very superficial, trivial stuff. It didn't require a lot in order to get yourself lynched. 
Yeah, so she goes into the records and finds, you know, all of the stuff that's on paper, you know, as the justification for a lynching. And it finds that a lot of it is stuff like, quote, mistaken identity or just insult, bad reputation. People were lynched for violating contract, giving evidence, frightening child by shooting at rabbits. I mean, these were all of the offenses that led to lynchings. And Wells compiles this and starts writing about it. She has a sort of special place in the data journalism community because one of the essays that she writes about this has a bunch of charts mm-hmm. and you know she kind of offers a defense of data journalism. She says a conclusion that is based upon a presumption instead of the best evidence is unworthy of a moment's consideration. And so she mm. really just tries to lay out the facts around um, you know the enormous rise in lynchings in this moment. Did you have an Ida B. Wells conference room at 538? <laughs> we didn't have a conference room, but I think we wrote a couple articles about it. And there is a, um, I think, an, I th- I'm going to butcher the name, but I think it's like the Ida B. Wells Data for Justice Initiative or something. Love that. It's like a really laudable organization. Wow, that's cool, yeah. Um, but in this incident, you know, so she combines this sort of hard-nosed, hard-edged journalism with a real, you know, furor and righteousness. And mm-hmm. in this incident, she writes an editorial about this killing, the the lynching of these three men. And then in response, when she's out of town, there is this attack on her newspaper office. And I just want to highlight, you know, one of the things that Wells revealed in her data journalism is this sort of like escalation from relatively minor incidents that eventually lead to lynching. Mm -hmm. And this story that she's now involved in points out that exact thing. I mean, it's like... People open a grocery store. It gets attacked. There's mm-hmm. some shots fired. It leads to a lynching. It leads to f- to an editorial. It leads to then more of, of this, you know, and it's just like this exact cycle is playing out um, involving her now. So what, what happens? She's out of town, I said. Do either of you know Philadelphia, New York? We're not sure exactly where she's out of town, but she's out of town. What yeah. happens to her office? So the mob um, wants to stop her from printing these editorials, and they decide that the way that they're going to do that is by destroying the printing press. This actually happens a fair amount in the South, the attacks on printing presses. It happens to abolitionists um, before Mm -hmm. the war. It happens to civil rights activists. It's part of... Uh, frankly, the fascism of the Deep South, which is we yeah. will destroy these means of communication because these words and ideas are so threatening to our system of government and our way of life. And so they come in, they destroy the printing press, I think they burn down the building, and they leave a warning, which was actually kind of clear from the burned down building, that they would kill Wells if she came back. Um, and so there is this pretty serious threat looming over Wells when mm-hmm. she does return to Memphis. Yeah. And, and people warned her about this as well, too. So she was not completely unaware. But I think going back to what Nikki said, like this, the South always viewed the pen as the same as the sword. I mean, they saw words as inflammatory because they were. Words are powerful. Yeah. Information is powerful. And so um, in destroying this press, it was meant to really cut off her ability to reach people, cut off her ability to keep doing the work that she's doing. And she's undaunted. I mean, it's, it's no small thing to lose your business, but she doesn't stop. She, she does relocate. She ends up moving to Chicago and sort of settling in Chicago, but all of her work and her research in her data collection, she keeps publishing. And that's what's so um, courageous as well. Um, I want to talk about her continued career in, briefly New York and then Chicago. But on this incident where the mob breaks in and destroys her printing press and burns down her building, I mean, I think I know the answer to this. But Kelly, like, (laughs) you know, there is obviously an irony there uh, in like, oh, you're accusing us of being a a extrajudicial mob that's just running around causing violence. Well, we'll show you. We're going to break into your building and burn it down. Yeah. Yeah. Was there any sense of perspective or irony? Or is it at this (laughs) at that point? Is it just like. Or any self awareness, you know, or at that no. point, it's just like mob violence. Everyone's in a. In a I froth. mean, that that is how mobs and white supremacy operates. There is, it's absurd, and it doesn't have to make sense in order for it to be implemented. So, yeah, um, yeah they're not trying to appeal to a rationale here. They are trying to instill fear and really terrorize the community, not just Ida B. Wells. Anyone who was black living in that community, whether you knew Wells or not, it was terrifying to see that you could be next. You know, that if this, if you follow this line of work, if you try to compete with us, you're next. And so, um, 
the message was loud and clear. Right, because they're not mad that she's speaking out and calling them an uh, unlawful mob. They're mad that she's speaking yeah. out. Period. Yeah. 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 All right. So she decides to leave. I mean, what do you make of or what do you know of about that decision? I mean, I'm sure it was an incredibly painful decision. I'm sure it reflected a lot of these other decisions to leave. Kelly, you know, as we said, you, you a lot of your work and your forthcoming book kind of tries to recast some of these moments as an act of agency yeah, yeah, and refusal. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I talk about flight as this tool in which black people leave as a almost as like a, a weapon as well. They choose to relocate themselves, find other places to be. And it's a double-edged sword in some ways. I mean, there are many benefits and advantages to going to the North or to being in Chicago. But as Ida B. Wells will also soon find that in a decade or so, you know, in 1919, Chicago is also, you know, hit with massive racial riots and um, unrest. And so there really isn't sort of a safe space that people can go. But there are places that are safer, if you will. (laughs) Um, But it is, it's difficult. You know, people don't realize how hard it is to sort of leave a place that you love, to leave a place that you still have, you know, connections and friends and family members. And to start all over again um, is no easy thing, but people did it all the time. Um, Sometimes they left permanently. Sometimes they left for short periods of time. Um, Wells leaves permanently, though. She she goes to Chicago. She even goes abroad for um, Mm -hmm. a period in her life. But she never returns to to Memphis to live. And she remains an activist. When she's in Chicago, she gets married. So if you read about her later life, you'll read about her as Ida B. Wells Barnett. And she founds the city's first black women's club, the first black kindergarten, the first black suffrage organization. There are all of these ways that the she's... The NAACP. Yeah. She's a founding member of the NAACP. She is yeah. continuing her work in all of these different ways. Um, if you watch it, the musical Suffs, she makes an appearance in there for her suffrage yeah. work. Um, but anyway, so there's... Um, there's a whole life that she leaves after leaving Memphis, and she is definitely worthy of a, a few more episodes because she's involved in all of these different episodes. Yeah. Especially the anti-lynching mm-hmm. campaign. I mean, she was at the helm of that, trying to get people like President Wilson and the federal administration to make lynching a federal crime, um, which, you know, American presidents up until Biden had refused to do. Um And it takes a long time to get this recognition, um, which almost baffled me because it was like, wait, lynching is murder. So easiest win. Is that not on the books? (laughs) Like, how is that not on the books? Like, it just there. There was a lot about this moment that is um, confounding to me. I don't know if we've done a federal lynch law. Well, we haven't. But yeah, episode. So we should do that. Yeah. So we will do. We should do more on Ida B. Wells, and we should certainly do more on that crusade for an anti-lynching law which is really fascinating um there's a street named after ida b wells in chicago in 2020 mm-hmm. she's posthumously awarded a pulitzer prize for her reporting and then if you do go to memphis there is a little plaque at the people's grocery which by the way i'm putting that at the top of the list of store names the people's grocery Who i love it yeah love it's it. a co-op yeah uh, i love they, it too yeah <laughs> yeah they, they, they sell a lot of turmeric off there <laughs> <laughs> Um, but uh, yeah, it, there is a plaque there uh, recounting this story. But let's uh, let's leave it there with the story of um, the incident in Memphis in 1892. Before we go, let's do a couple also on this day's other incidents, um, moments that happened on this day, May 28th. And actually, we only have two on the list here, but one in 1892, right around the same time, um, the Sierra Club is organized in San Francisco. Um, start of a a nascent environmental movement there. And in 1959, the U.S. Army launched Abel, a rhesus monkey, and Baker, a squirrel monkey, aboard a Jupiter missile, a suborbital flight, which both primates survived. Survived! Yeah. There you go. (laughs) Prequel the planet of the apes. Yeah. (laughs) It's poor monkeys. uh, (laughs) I feel like we're really dropping the ball as a, um, you know, as one of the top esoteric animal political stories podcast out there <laughs> agreed but not doing a full episode on abel and baker we got to <laughs> especially since they survived uh yeah all right maybe in the newsletter we'll write a little bit more about these two because this is the first time hearing about them anyway <laughs> those are things that happened on may 28th and we will leave it there 
other than a reminder that in the newsletter we're doing a lot of this. We're bringing you a lot of dates that happen throughout the week, lots of little tidbits for you to learn about, and then also a little bit of original analysis and writing from us and others and friends of the show. So go subscribe to the newsletter, thisdaypod.com. Anyway, that brings us to the end of the episode. Nicole Hemmer, thanks to you as always. Thank you, Jody. And Kelly Carter-Jackson, thanks to you. My pleasure. Hey, it's Jody. Did you know that Radiotopia has a reality dating podcast? It is called Hang Up, and it's kind of like a queer cross between The Bachelor and Love is Blind. Each week, the star goes on phone dates with the callers, and then one caller is eliminated week by week. They do not see each other. Here's a taste of Hang Up. Our star, Timo, is 41 years old and recently divorced. I haven't been on a single date in 18 months. But now, they're looking for someone special. And like... Really hot sex. Really hot public sex. (laughs) So we set them up with six callers to date exclusively over the phone. I feel like I could talk to you for hours. Now at the end of all this, the last caller standing can choose the star back as their soulmate and go on an all-expenses-paid vacation together or choose a cash prize instead. Hang Up is hosted by Zakia Gibbons, one of my favorite people at Radiotopia, and not for nothing, the artwork for this new season is incredible. So check it all out. It is like nothing else being done in podcasting right now. Season two of Hang Up, out now on your favorite podcast platform. Radiotopia.